Please be seated. Thank you, Gus. Great reading of Scripture. Y gracias, Jesús, por tus palabras en la comunión. Good morning, church. Buenos días, mis hermanos y hermanas. Bienvenidos a la Iglesia de Cristo en Antioch. Antioquia o Antioch? Antioquia. Antioquia. Don't forget that. It's Antioquia. Es bueno que estemos aquí juntos en el Día del Señor porque Dios es bueno. Todo el tiempo. Church, it is good to be here this morning because God is good. All the time. And you know how we know that? You could actually have said something, I suspect. <laughs> well, I like, I, tell us, thank you. I like it because Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I don't know about you, but I not only feel the Lord within me and all around me, but when I read the Word of God, it really comes to fruition. I know that God is good all the time. I know that the Lord saves us by His grace. In fact, you know, Dios es bueno todo el tiempo. That theme is throughout Romans, Romans 1 through 16. Now, for those of us, for those of you who are visiting this morning, we've been going through the book of Romans for the past 10 Sundays, but today we're going to wrap it up. I would love to go take the next six months, but I think that little be, that may be too much for you. So what we've done, and, and you know this, for those of you who are not already entrenched in a Bible class, the home improvement class, we're going verse by verse. In fact, this morning we'll be looking at Romans 2 verse 1. We've covered only the first chapter in that class, and if you want to go deeper into Romans, then, then attend that class, if you're, especially if you're not going someplace else for a Bible study. Now, remember, for those of you who actually maybe have not been here for the series, and for those of us who have, that Paul lays out a very clear gospel. The purpose of Romans, the three purposes of Romans, Romans 1, 16, and 17, were to clarify the gospel, unify the church, and reveal God's righteousness. And Paul has done that par excellence. From all the way from 1 through 11, where he really lays it out. He says in chapters 1 through 3, that actually was alluded to earlier this morning, not by text, but by words. All men have sinned. We've all sinned. All people have sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. That's the problem. That's the dilemma the world is in. And that's the dilemma that we were in prior to Christ. And then Paul lays out in chapters 4 and 5, however, that's the, that's the problem. Here's the solution. We are justified by faith in Christ. Justified. Therefore, we are, we are given God's grace, and therefore we are saved. The problem is, is that we sin. The solution is faith in Christ. And so he says in chapters 6 and 7 um, and 8, really, that um, we are set apart. So you've got chapters 1 through 3 dealing with condemnation. Chapters 4 and 5, justification. Chapters 6, 7, and 8, uh, sanctification. We are God's people. We are set apart. We are saints. Not from what we've done, but for what God has done through us. So we've been condemned. We've been now justified and sanctified. And then Paul explains in Romans chapters 9 through 11 that in this way all of Israel will be saved. We, you know, God's people have been restored. And then beginning with chapter 12, he'll talk about application. One more shun, right? Your condemnation, justification, sanctification, restoration, and now application. So last week we looked at verse 1 of Romans 12. Because we have been saved by grace through faith, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, 
which is our reasonable service, our spiritual worship. Now, following that, Paul explains very carefully how we do that. Unlike probably other sermons in this series, we're going to do a little bit of a word study. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them or get on your iPhone, it's okay, or your smartphone there and look up the New Testament. Go to the book of Romans chapter 12 and let's pick up in just a moment, not right this second. We're going to pick up with verses 9 through 21, the very verses that Gus read earlier, earlier this morning. Last week, um, we, the word celebrate is the wrong word. We remembered this nation and the losses that we experienced on 9-11. There was the, you know, we had the 18th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers, the Pentagon, and the, and the fields of Pennsylvania when that fourth plane went down. I remember hearing Jack King. You may not know who he is. He's a retired four-star Army general. I never met General King when I was on active duty, but obviously had heard about him. <clears throat> there aren't many four-stars around. The Air Force has 12, and the Army probably has maybe 18 or 19 in the world. We're talking about the air is really thin up there when you reach that fourth button, that fourth star. Anyway, I was hearing Jack Keane on one of the uh, news channels, a national news channel, talking about courage. At the time, he was at the Pentagon during the, during the attack when American Airlines 77, the third plane, uh, went into the Pentagon there in D.C. Um, he was talking about courage. He made a statement that really kind of made me think, you know, this, is, this, can, this can preach. This can move right over to the Christian walk. He said, courage knows no race or gender or age. And it was clearly seen, witnessed on 9-11 18 years ago. Courage knows no race, no language, it knows uh, no gender, male, female, and it knows no age, young, old, makes no difference. Now there are those who think that courage um, cannot be taught, that you either have it or you don't, and I do think there's some truth to that, there's some merit to it, but at the same time, I know how much we train. We and I know there were those civilians who just instinctively acted courageously. But the ones that we normally applaud, and we applauded last Wednesday, were all the first responders. It was your firefighters, police forces, uh, medical personnel with the Pentagon, the military, those four large uh, um, groups of people, those four communities are all courageous, but they train, 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 train. I know because I, for 30 plus years, I, I was in some of the training. In fact, a lot of it. Every person who has a certain uh, task, you train for crises. You, you know, no matter what that crises is, that's what you train for. And so, when the time comes, God forbid, but when the time comes, there's a major accident, in my case, or there's a critical incident. That's what the chaplains did. We trained for that. And, but, you know, all, at the appropriate time, you act instinctively based on training. It is more of a habitual moment. And those of you who uh, are firefighters, thinking of Mike and others and, you know, Jimbo, the you know, police forces and so forth, those of you who for your entire life have, uh, have trained, you know what I'm talking about. So it, it, is, it is courage, but it's also just doing what you've trained to do. The connection is, that's exactly what the Christian life is all about. And Paul really personifies it right here in Romans 12. Let's very quickly go to Hebrews chapter 5, because I think this will tie that thought and this text together. In Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is, um, <clears throat> is comparing uh, mediators and trying to convince the Hebrew Christians that they should always stay with Jesus Christ. And so, in chapter 1, the author of Hebrews says, Jesus is greater than the angels. Believe it or not, there were those who were thinking maybe he's just an angel. 
you know, not the Son of God, not God made manifest in the flesh. And so God, through the book of Hebrews, says, oh no, he's, he's my son. He's not an angel. And then the author of Hebrews says, he is greater than Moses, the lawgiver. And he's greater than Aaron, the high priest. And then he wants to make a connection to Jesus being both the high priest and the king. And the only one he could think of, I'm inspired by God, was Melchizedek, right? Don't lose me on this. We're going to reach a moment here. Um, and so this is what the author of Hebrews says in the 11th verse. Hebrews 5. About this, Melchizedek, Jesus about this, we have much to say, but you have become dull of hearing. For though by now you ought to be teachers, you need someone again to teach you the first principles of God's word. You need milk, not solid food. Listen, for solid food is for teleos in Greek. Solid food is for the mature, those who are complete, those who have trained their faculties to distinguish right from wrong. We just don't automatically do right and avoid wrong. In times of crises, the Christians who seem to always make the right decisions are those who have trained themselves no less than a firefighter or a policeman or a medical personnel or a soldier. You've trained yourself to distinguish right from wrong. And so what Paul does in Romans 12 is he explains this training process. And this is how he does it. He opens up with verse 9 and he says, let love be genuine. Now keep in mind, he's already told this, chapters 1 through 11, this is the good news of Christ. He clarifies the gospel. Now he tells us how to use the gospel, right? How to, how to utilize it. And he opens it up. This is the foundation of the entire text. Let love be genuine. Now, I tell you, in the original text, there are only three words. And literally, taken out of any kind of a Greek syntax, literally it reads the whole love, agape. He's talking about agape love. Anupokritas. Unhypocritical. He's saying the, the way that you train yourself to understand the gospel and then reflect on, on uh, being saved by grace is that your love must be authentic. I tell you, of all the themes in, in the Gospels that Jesus highlights over and again, and last week we alluded to two chapters, Matthew 6, Matthew 23, we're not going to do it again this morning, but hypocrisy. No one likes a hypocrite. When I act uh, unauthentically, you don't like it. And I don't blame you. And I hope we can't find a moment when that occurred. But I know in my life, of course I've been, I've been disingenuous at times. You know, I mean, I'm, I have feet of clay. Walk away and my heart condemns me and God condemns me. And I go back and I, if I can and I'll apologize for that, you know, for that moment. But in fact, Paul says to wit and everyone else, let love be genuine. Matthew 6, 1, beware of practicing your piety before men just to be seen by them, Jesus said. For I say to you, they have their own reward. What in the world is he talking about? Here's what he's talking about. Their reward is as superficial as their act. Beware of practicing your piety before men just to be seen by them, for verily they have their own reward. And then he goes on, when you give and when you pray and when you fast, don't do it to be seen by others. Do it solely to be seen by God. Let love be genuine. Now here's how love can be. This is the training manual. Are you with me still? This is how love is genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. 
Church, I am absolutely convinced, and I, and I use myself, and I suspect if I need it, then I think you need it as well. I use myself. Let, hold fast to what is good. Hate what is evil. If we practice one half of what we know, we would change the world around us. You are well read in Scripture. More than, probably more than most all communities of faith. I, I, I really believe that. And clearly, clearly far more than those in the community who don't worship God, who don't even know, you know, Hezekiah from Malachi, who, who don't know Scripture. If we hold fast to what we know is good, even half the time, it will change those around us. So, Paul tells us, how can love be authentic? How can love be unhypocritical? Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Now, you know, in what little bit of Spanish I've been trying to learn, um, you know my thoughts on family. I mean, when I, you know, I mean, I took Spanish about 100 years ago, a couple of years, and, and I grew up with my father speaking Spanish and others, so I heard it all the time in my house, but in fact, you know, I didn't learn it that well. And then, of course, we have, you know, at least a quarter of our church family who's Hispanic, and so I really want to learn. Estoy intentando aprender español. Se paciente, por favor. Be patient. Thank you. Brotherly affection. We are family. There is no theme in all of Scripture that communicates more clearly to what God's people are than the word family. Brother, sister. I know that when I arrived here, what, maybe 15 years ago, somebody asked me, what do you want to be called? And I'm not sure exactly what that meant, not by name. I said, really, the only, I just want to be brother. Brother. It's the only descriptive that will go to the other side of eternity. All of your other titles that you wear, no matter what they are, you know, doctor, boss, uh, I don't know, you know, all your titles, teacher, professor, they'll all on this side stay right here. Only brother and sister will move to the other side. Somos la familia de Dios. We are the family of God. And so this is what Paul says. Love one another with brotherly affection. Never flag in zeal. Are you with me in the Bible? Never flag in zeal. Verse 11. Be aglow with the Spirit, serve the Lord. Tell me again, Paul, how in the world can I make love genuine? Well, you don't brag about it. Never flag in zeal. Humility. I don't know, you know, C.S. Lewis is credited, if you read much of Lewis, I, he was a, a genius writer, one of the greatest apologists in the 20th century, I think, for Christianity. Um, and he's credited, although I, I, I've not been able to find it exactly like this. I think it was Rick Warren reading Lewis, and then in one of Warren's writings, he wrote, uh, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. And it's a great reminder. We're not talking about self-deprecation, me flogging myself all the time. God, God has given us all gifts to use and he wants us to use them. And so he writes, never flag in zeal, be aglow with the Spirit, serve the Lord. Verse 12, rejoice in your hope. Be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. By the way, whenever we read the word hope in the New Testament, we're not talking about as in, in the English language, I'm not sure about Spanish, um, es, espero, hope, I, I hope, what is, como se dice hope in Espanol? Espanol. I didn't hear that well, so I'm not going to repeat it. So I'm gonna... <laughs> but I suspect you heard it better than I heard it just then. Rejoice in your hope. In English, it is an uncertainty. We're going through about a two-week drought. My yard and every plant we have, and every, it, it's begging for water. One day the Lord's going to open the heavens and we're going to have a deluge. That's just the way it is. The spigot turns on, the spigot turns off, and that's all part of God's plan. That's the natural order of creation. But I do say out loud, I hope it rains today. 
It may not, but I hope it rains today. But I'm telling you, in the Greek text, in the Greek language, in our Bible, hope is not an uncertainty. It is an absolute surety knowing that God will provide precisely what God has promised. So when Paul writes, rejoice in your hope, he's not saying it may or may not occur. He's saying that it is a definite. Romans 8, 24 and 25, Paul writes, um, now, I've got it right here. Forgive me, I thought I had it. Yeah. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, then we wait for it with patience. He's talking about the second coming of Christ and, and the fruition of our salvation. And he says, for in this hope we were saved. And then he explains, hope that is seen is not hope. Who hopes for what he sees? If we hope for what we do not see, then we wait for it with patience. How in the world can I be patiently waiting for Christ to come if I'm not sure of my salvation? I am very impatient. And so Paul clearly reminds us we can be patient and not be in a hurry because it's a done deal. It's already happened. In this hope, we are saved. What hope? The hope that Christ will come again and take us with him. 1 Thessalonians 4. That's the rapture, caught up together with him in the air. That's what the word means in the text. Okay, uh, hope, uh, verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints, practice hospitality. I told you this is going to be kind of a word study, so this is a little bit different from the normal way that I, I preach. But Paul, what's Paul doing? He's giving us a training manual. You want love to be genuine? Hold fast to what is good. Show brotherly affection. Never flag in zeal. Rejoice in your hope. Contribute. Contribute to the needs of the saints. By the way, contributing, Paul says just a few verses before that, is a harismata. It is a spiritual gift. Any gift, by the way, from God is a miraculous gift. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Two different lists of these spiritual gifts. Practice hospitality. There are those who really believe, and I think it certainly goes against Scripture, that their contribution should only go to the church. And Paul does say, contribute to the needs of the saints. But then he adds, practice hospitality. It's a great word, hospitality. Philoxenia. Two words from phileo, I love, love, not agape, but familia love, and xenia, strangers. The word is really foreigners. What Paul is saying is this, if you want your love to be genuine, you need to give to those who are in need in the church, and you need to love strangers. Hospitality. You need to love foreigners. And one more thing before we leave this quickly. God is not political. <laughs> it was never political. If a political issue was a moral issue, then it becomes a moral issue, not politics. You can, you can vote accordingly, but if it's a moral issue, then we need to really weigh in on it. If it's just a political issue, as, as far as I'm concerned, certainly from the Lord's pulpit, there's no way that I'm going to weigh in on that. But on anything moral, I will. Paul does... By the way, they're in Rome. And he's writing the church that are... You think we're ethnically mixed with, uh, with Hispanics and, 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 and uh, English speakers and so forth. Nothing like they were. Egypt and, and, and Rome and Palestine, you know. Um, um, Africa. And you, you've got these nations all over the Roman world who have congregated in Rome. And so the church of God was established there. And Paul says, while you're there, brothers and sisters, remember, contribute to the needs of the saints, but love foreigners. Illegal, legal, it makes no difference. You love strangers. It's part of who we are. And we need to remember that. We need to love 
foreigners, strangers, legal, illegal. God says no difference. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you and um, do not curse them. Very quickly, Matthew 5, 43 and 44, Jesus is talking about the old law, and he says, You have heard that it hath been said by the men of old, love your, in, uh, love your neighbors and, um, um, what does it say? Say, I can't hear that. What? Love your neighbors. Ah, and hate your enemies. And then what did Jesus say? But I say unto you, love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. We normally end right there. The next phrase is critical. So that you may be sons, daughters, of your Father in heaven. Why? For God makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. The reason we are to love our enemies and bless those who persecute us, pray for them, is because we have God's DNA. And Paul reminds us of our family. He says, your father is Abba. Your father is God. Bless those who persecute you and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. I tell you, there are those who simply uh, can't rejoice. I really believe we understand weeping with those who weep. It's the rejoicing part that I think we have a problem with. Now, that's, that's a general statement. I understand that. Uh, last January, Debbie and I went with my brother and his wife on a seven-day cruise to the, to the Western Caribbean. Uh, it's it was our first time to the Caribbean, believe it or not. We just, we just had never made the trip, and we wanted to go to the Caribbean. I come back from the cruise, and I know other people in Nashville other than Antioch, so don't start thinking of names here. But I come back from that cruise, and I'm talking with a friend of mine, and I'm saying, we just finished a cruise, a seven-day cruise. It was wonderful. We went to the Caribbean. Oh, I've done that a dozen times. <laughs> what? You know, I, I've, shoot, I've, we've, I've, I've cruised the Caribbean. You really want to go on a cruise, you need to go to the, on the Hawaiian Island cruise. And they're always one-upping, one-up. No matter what the conversation is, one-up. I am, my brother, by the way, who had been on a dozen cruises in the Caribbean, all he did was rejoice with me the whole time. Okay, rejoice um, verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with, with, with one another. Did you notice our singing every Sunday morning? I mean, we harmonize. And I have sat in, in, in churches and congregations and all over the world, all different denominations. And the one thing that we, one of the several things that I think we bring to the table that Christendom needs to really understand is how to sing, harmony. And I suspect the reason is because we don't have anything that will, that will help us. Us, you know, but the, the fact is we harmonize. We could sound, you know, make that joyful noise, and I think the Lord's okay with that. It could be cacophonous, but it isn't. It's tenor and bass, soprano and alto. Not that we have to sing that way. We could sing in unison, but it, it reminds me if that's how we live. We live harmoniously together, and that's a reflection of genuine love. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. This is how you live in harmony. And I know the time is this. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil. With this, we're going to bring it to a close. But when, when Paul, he basically, basically closes with that thought. Repay no one evil for evil. Overcome, verse 21, evil with good. You want to know how to live the gospel of Christ then let love be genuine. Hold fast. Show brotherly love. Don't be proud and arrogant. By the way, this list corresponds to 1 Corinthians 13 so well. 
right? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Um, love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or boastful or arrogant or rude. Does not insist on its own way. Love does not rejoice at wrong. Rejoices in the right. Bears all things. Believes all things. Uh, um, endures all things. Hopes all things. Love never ends. Fifteen things, by the way, Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 13. Guess how many he mentions here? <laughs> Fifteen. And if you were to take it and put those two together, 1 Corinthians 13, Romans 12, 9 through 21, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, uh, 13 describes how we love patient, kindness, uh, uh, humbly, uh, you know, without, without pride. And then he says right here in uh, Romans 12, this is how you apply patience and kindness and humility. And then he'll close, overcome evil with good. Jesus said in Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Repay no one evil for good. It's not a quid pro quo. It's not God will only forgive us if we forgive others. We forgive others because God has forgiven us. And Paul explains that so clearly in Romans. And even though we're bringing it to a close today, I want you to know, I don't have to say this, but it's the truth. I'm not sure if it will indict me or not. If it does, that's no big deal. It is the most, it has become the most meaningful study for me, preaching and teaching in my entire ministry, the last 11 weeks. Not talking about delivery, I'm talking about my own walk with Christ. It has helped me more than any single study I've ever done. And I am so grateful to God. I understand the gospel more clearly. I understand how to unify the church more perfectly. And really, maybe for nearly the first time, I can see clearly how God's righteousness has come through. Let us pray.